In 2011, some German scientists published data that suggested they were the first people ever to make a super explosive in C2N14. But turns out, they were actually wrong. Cue the intro. Hello, welcome back to another episode. Side of explosions and fire, yay! Okay, so the Germans did make the super explosives, but what they got wrong was they weren't the first people to actually do it. The Germans knew of another synthesis of what they called the open form of C2N14, while they had made the closed form. After that initial paper was published, another bunch of very smart people worked out that the open form doesn't actually exist, and it quickly cyclizes to form the closed form at room temperature conditions. Meaning that in 2011, the people that were studying closed form weren't the first people to study it. They were just the first people to get the structure right. Now this may seem very trivial and really not that relevant, but if you had to guess what year this compound was actually technically discovered, what would you guess? Maybe 2000s? Maybe the 1990s possibly? It was patented in 1961. Good year. Was it? It's actually quite surprising to have a molecule like this, which seems like a futuristic explosive, being discovered over five decades ago. Fuck the 60s, man. This compound has picked up a nickname across the years of azidyl azide azide? Azidyl azide. I can never remember it because it's a bit of a stupid nickname. I like calling it isocyanogen tetraazide because it acknowledges the fact that we made it from the 1960s version, even though it's actually not a tetraazide because one of the groups is a tetrazole. All of this leads to an important point because because in the 2011 paper that got the structure right for the first time, the synthesis that was used was, well, hard. <laughs> Not something that I could replicate in my shitty jam jar ridden rat fest of a shed here. However, the patent for the 1961 explosive is much more accessible. The whole reaction scheme looks something like this. Easy as dicks. We can add a little bit more detail to this chart to, to kind of say where I got all the chemicals from. So let's put an atom in red if that atom at one point originated from the hardware store down the road. God bless you Bunnings, just a very standard hardware store. For example, this is urea, which I got for like a couple dollars a kilo on the diagram. That's urea up in the top corner. So we can mark all of those atoms red. And then I also got the bleach from Bunnings so we can mark that red. And then I used the bleach and the urea to make hydrazine. So that hydrazine is also red, right? Because both of those nitrogens and the hydrazine originated at the hardware store, right? We get how it works. Okay, so we can fill in the rest of the chart. Now, that's a lot of red. <laughs> so in our super explosive there, we've got both carbons and 10 of the 14 nitrogens originated from my local hardware store. So where'd the other four nitrogens come from? So this is sodium nitrite and I had to go to great lengths to get this. It was from eBay and I had to pay like a couple dollars. It was pretty easy. And if we put the sodium nitrite in blue, we can see that's the remaining four nitrogens. That's where basically all the chemicals came from. It seems really fucking easy when I do it like that. Like I'll just go to the hardware store on the Friday night and then Sunday I've got some of the tetraazide. It didn't exactly go like that. In fact, it took me three years. There's a step there where I made sodium azide from scratch and I did that oh, years and years ago. So not only should you never do this because it's stupendously poisonous and stupendously dangerous, but it's also at times really fucking difficult. So that last step in particular where we go from the isocyanogen tetrabromide to the tetraazide, that whole step is on my second channel. In short, I basically just dissolved up the tetrabromide in water and acetone and then added sodium azide and then waited a bit and then got fucking huge crystals of this super explosive. Holy moly, these crystals are large. Now we can finally see the explosive properties. Actually, let's take it back a step because one of the big reasons I wanted to make this video is this compound has a reputation as being mankind's greatest explosive. Azido azide azide, the most explosive chemical compound ever created. Azido azide azide, la plus instable des substances. L'azido azide azide est un explosif si instable qu'il explose en toutes circonstances. C'est le produit chimique le plus taré que le monde ait jamais porté. Okay, so I've, I've actually done it. I've made the tetraazide, I've made the azidal azidal azido azide azide. And the crystals are fucking huge. And we can see the first time that the sensitivity is not through the roof. Okay, don't get me wrong. It's sensitive as dicks, you know, like this is really sensitive. But is it the most sensitive explosive ever created? No. In fact, I can name two, maybe three explosives that I've made personally that are more sensitive than this compound. 
We smack it with a hammer, sure it detonates, but we can see that we can smack it with a hammer and it not detonate which is more than we can say for other explosives such as touch powder. We can't even lightly tap it with a hammer and not have it detonate. So how does this compound actually get this kind of reputation? Well, it's hard to make, so other people don't make it and test it. And what the German group in 2011, what they published is they said, hey, it's too sensitive and we can't test it because it's below our threshold for sensitivity. Things in shock and friction tests led to explosive decomposition. Which doesn't mean, suppose that's a fucking zero then. It just means that they have some cutoff and I think it was 0.25 joules, which isn't that low. If you have a super sensitive explosive, no one cares if it's 0.01 joules or 0.02 joules. They just care that it's too sensitive to handle. Just because it gets put in that extreme category doesn't mean it's just gonna fucking explode on its own whatever it wants. They had it in a shockproof explosive case in a dark climate control room and it blew up. I think somebody said something mean about it somewhere and it was like Boy, can So anyway, I think we cleared up the myth. It's demonstrably wrong to say that this is the most sensitive compound ever known. Moving on, let's actually look at some of the detonations. So a lot of organic compounds will burn, and if you heat them up, perhaps they'll detonate, but exposure to flame will cause fire. Exposure to flame for the tetraazide causes some instant detonation with some tremendous power. It's excellent, don't get me wrong. We have seen performance like this from other super explosives, such as like silver nitrotetrazole, and even to an extent, the silver fulminate. But this compound is doing it without any heavy metal. It's just purely carbon and nitrogen. And it's just that high heat of formation. The fact that it produces seven nitrogen molecules when it explodes is so huge. It has such a large gas generation. Those two carbons don't do anything, but they don't need to do anything. The nitrogen does all the work and it's some super powerful explosive. It has a melting point of about 80 degrees and a decomposition point of about 110. So if we heat it at just the right rate, we can see it quickly melts, then starts to decompose, and then violently detonates. Not many super sensitive explosives you can actually melt before they detonate. Do you see all the explosive on this foil? No, exactly. But when we put fire to it, holy shit dicks. Not many compounds can explode when they're in that tiny little amounts separated. So all of this work has been done on a scale that I can't even measure because my scales don't really work well below like eight milligrams. But what if we did something crazy and we scaled it up to the point where I could actually measure it? So I did a few synthesis and here is 20 milligrams of C2N14 isocyanogen tetraazide. On metric units, it's about eight and a half fuck tons. For this, we're gonna have to crack out the nicest fuses I have. Ah, they're like a Cuban cigar. Look at these Visco fuses. So we strap our explosive to a can and we light our beautiful fuses and we just wait for the explosion. Fuck. So we reach this weird point here where we've got 20 milligrams of a super explosive that's super sensitive and it's strapped to a can. So we don't have many options. Um, so it's time to do something moronically stupid. Thanks a lot to my Patreons, and there's a lot of people that helped me along the way over the years to make the explosives. Doriner, 335A, he's not around on YouTube anymore, but he was a great help. The Science Madness people, and everyone in the YouTube comments that helped me with Tetrazole particular points when I got stuck on my second channel, that was a real help. I feel like we're crowdsourcing explosives here, which is um wrong. Yep, subscribe, subscribe to my other YouTube channel, um, download my band's mixtape, fucking suck me off, I don't know. Oh, I'm bad at these end bits. Um, just 